now. Welcome to the May 5th uh, policy session, and we're going to start out with what, Gary? Yes, first we're going to do roll call, commissioners, to demonstrate you're here, although we can see you, too. Uh, first, Chair Bernard. Yep. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Humberston. Here. You are all here and present. We have uh, several items for issues, and we have up to three hours total for issues today, divided over two parts of the day. We're going to start at 10 a.m. We will have a hard stop at 1130, and then we'll resume issues at 2 p.m. today. So there's plenty of time to ask all the questions you wish, commissioners, and to have a good discussion on some very good topics on your agenda. We will begin, as always, with the coronavirus update. Nancy Bush, Director of Disaster Management and Incident Commander of the Emergency Operations Center will begin. And uh, if you want to introduce your guests now or if they're later on, Nancy, we can hold. Yeah, I'll go ahead and introduce my guests now. Thank you very much for having us today. Uh, today I have uh, Dr. Sarah Present, who is the county's health officer. And then I also have Julie Albers, who is a manager with public health and also a communicable disease expert. So I will start with uh, just giving a briefing on what's going on here in the EOC. Um, and then we'll go into the reopening piece after that. So uh, some of our numbers today. So in Oregon, there are 2,759 positives, 109 deaths, 60,968 negatives. Clackamas County has 226 positives. And that is up four from Friday, so over the weekend. We have seven deaths, 5,881 negatives. Multnomah County has 754 positives, 46 deaths, 13,785 negatives. Washington County has 526 positives, 11 deaths, 8,886 negatives. And for the first time, um, we have hospitalization of uh, the COVID patients is now below 100 at, at 90. Um, so a few things that are going on here in the EOC. Um, we are addressing some of the COVID-19 disparities uh, when it comes to the Latinx community. Um, we're seeing that that particular community um, is seeing some more positive cases. So some of the things that we are doing is um, increasing some testing and the contact tracing that goes along with that testing, uh, working on helping getting them more case managers, um, and also working just on some basic needs for that particular population. Uh, we continue to receive some shipments from the state, so the, the, but the last couple shipments we have received has been quite small. Um, so small, like the last shipment we got was just like, five or 10 boxes of gloves. So it was very small. Um, and we continue to give them our burned rate and work through those issues with, um, with our PPE and what we have here on hand. Uh, we're starting a couple new outreach efforts for older adults. Um, one of them was having children write, to, write letters to those that are in long-term care facilities, um, especially those that are not able to see their families. So we're hoping that we'll will help brighten the days of both of those communities. Um, and we're identifying and reaching out to uh, seniors that may be struggling and with being loneliness um, and depression and uh, trying to provide them with some support as well. Uh, we're working on two big uh, food uh, distributions. One of them is at the Clackamas Town Center, which we're doing with the Salvation Army. And we're working on one that's gonna be in Canby at the fairgrounds. Um, and we have published a Clackamas reopening survey. It went out Friday around 4.30. And as of just a few minutes ago, we have 6,200 responses there. We have four basic questions. One of them is, uh, you know, where are you located in the county? Um, one of them is, you know, are you retired, working, um, unemployed? And yeah, I think those are the questions we're asking there. Then we have two open-ended questions where they have a limited amount of space. I think they have a thousand characters to answer those two, to add, or to put in uh, information for those two questions. So, and then that will also be available in Spanish either later today or early tomorrow. 
So that is my overall briefing for the EOC. Um, before we go into a reopening, are there any questions on that? Mr. <clears throat> Humberston has a question. Yeah, just one. Um, when you say that we've get, we've taken an, like 5,000 tests, is that 5,000 different people or is that some people more than once? Um, I will let Dr. President or Julie answer that question. Um, we we can get into more about testing. Um, the, the it is possible that it is some people more than once. So it's the total okay. number of tests that have been performed. Okay, so. thank you. Other questions? Oh, I think Martha. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is what. Do you really have to be exhibiting the symptoms before you get tested? What's the criteria for when the judgment call is made that somebody has to be tested? So currently we um, in public health are recommending that anybody with symptoms that are at all consistent, so even mild symptoms, get tested. For asymptomatic people to be tested, um, really want to caution that there's a potential false sense of security if you have a negative test because testing negative today doesn't mean that you don't test positive. Not getting better. Um, but that could be a tool that we use in certain outbreak investigations such as um, long-term care facilities or congregate living settings or potentially jails depending on what's happening there it could be useful to test asymptomatic people in a, a small um, uh, okay. defined population. But right now, unless you're exhibiting symptoms, there's no testing. So you could be asymptomatic and still spreading the virus. So um, the public health recommendation is for symptomatic people. And that, um, that means that the Oregon State Public Health Lab will likely not approve tests for asymptomatic okay. people not associated with an outbreak. However, everybody is welcome to go to their primary care practitioner and talk to them about testing. Um, and we don't have limitations on the commercial testing and how the, the practitioners are doing that. Again, the, we have recommended to test symptomatic people and only asymptomatic people who are in high risk groups, um, but it is up to individuals with their practitioners as well. And we don't know what the private, um, well, like our, our primary care physicians, the tests, they, we don't know what kind of tests you're using. Is there any consistency in the testing? Um, so most of our hospital systems have in-house labs where they're doing testing um, and then Quest and LabCorp are popular ones that are being used and there are a few other tests. There's the Abbott rapid test that um, a couple systems have. The, um, the consistency among the PCR tests, which most of these are, for the test for active disease <coughs> seems to be consistent across the different labs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like there's no other questions. So I'm gonna move on to reopening. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Julie and to Dr. President here in a couple minutes. But I did wanna talk about um, the reopening, um, we call it open organ, open Clackamas document that you received. Um, just to note that it is a draft document and we continue to work on that. This is a moving target. Um, I'm sure all of you know that and what you've seen in the uh, newspapers and just from the announcements from the governor's office. Um, so there's a number of safeguards that we need to put into place in order to restart businesses up. Um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of those safeguards are um, dependent on compliance with the governor's uh, governor brown's draft framework and what she's been putting out and continues to provide information on um, there will be three separate phases and julie will talk about that in just a moment uh, but the things that we really are going to have to look at and that are really on the county are the public health data testing contact tracing health system readiness which is something that we'll do in conjunction with our hospitals and here in the region uh, ppe and on the flip side, on the back side of that page or the second page, it talks about the safeguard status. Um, and there we do have a, um, a, a table there that helps hopefully understand some of those things and where we are in 
in the process. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie to give you more detail on this. Uh, one of the things we did wanna to highlight today, which Julie will talk about a, a little bit more detail is contact tracing and just the understanding of some of the complexities of some of these um, things that we have to have done before we can reopen. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you and Dr. President. Ashley, I'm going to step in for a second, Nancy. So, commissioners, I want to loop back. When we last talked with you last week, Nancy and her team presented a R3 plan, which was called Reopening, Recovery, and Resilience. Based on your feedback and also our EOC staff's input, we're, we're separating that plan and taking the Recovery and Resilience part out and holding on that for now because the priority is to address the governor's a reopening plan, which is what you're about to hear now, an update from staff. So just wanted to loop back to you. We're separating those three R's and focusing entirely on the reopening phase as asked by the governor. Yeah. Uh, so that's what you're here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah's gonna start us off, but before we get started, I wanna make sure my slides are advancing for you. So if I do this, do you see a new slide? Yay, tech working well. So thank you for having us and for your leadership in this difficult work. Um, we're really pleased to chat with you about reopening Oregon. We feel the antsiness in the community and um, amongst the cities. So um, take it away, Sarah. All right, thank you. So again, I'm Dr. Sarah Present. I'm the public health officer for Clackamas County. Um, I want to reiterate what Julie Albers just said in just thanking you all for your leadership um, and your support through this really challenging and difficult time. Um, I know that it may feel like we're behind the eight ball or that we you know, don't know what's coming next. And I just want to say that um, I feel, feel so proud of Clackamas County and your leadership. And I feel like we are actually far ahead of some other counties in our planning. Um, and we couldn't do any of that without, without your full support. So thank you. Um, go on to the next slide, Julie. Oops. Okay, so the Open Oregon Framework has been something in discussion, um, deep discussion for the last several weeks, definitely a lot in the last week. And then yesterday afternoon, um, Governor Kate Brown put out a more defined uh, document on the prerequisites for the phased reopening of Oregon. So the framework um, and the methods of monitoring include the, the following, and I'm just gonna go into these in a little bit more detail um, so that people know what we're looking at. The adequate supply of PPE, um, that has been defined um, better now that, uh, you that hospitals in the region must have, um, excuse me, uh, they must attest to a 30-day supply of PPE the small and rural hospitals must have a 14-day supply. I think all of the hospitals in our region are gonna be looking at needing to attest to a 30-day supply, and that's through their normal, um, normal channels without requesting through the EOC. Our county, though, has to ensure that our first responders also have PPE, and so that's the, the part that is our responsibility. Um, health systems readiness. So the, the definition of this has been clarified to, um, each hospital system, each region must attest to ability to have a 20% increase in suspected or confirmed COVID hospitalizations um, compared to what it is now. So everybody has to attest that they're ready to a surge, to have another surge. Uh, we can't reopen without having more cases. We know that. So the hospitals need to have the staff and capabilities to do that. And so that is at a regional level. What's at the county level is our ability to ensure that we have isolation for community members who, um, for whatever reason, cannot isolate in their home or don't have a home to isolate in. Um, the public health data. So I am pleased to report that it's not just a decline in cases because that can be confusing. As we open up, we know that we're gonna have more cases. What we're looking at is a 14 day decline in hospital admissions. So that's looking really at the severe cases and we wanna have that going down. We know that as we increase testing, we're likely to have more uh, mild symptomatic cases showing up. Um, so our total numbers may increase, but we really want to look at the severity of the disease. And so we're looking at hospital admissions, as well as emergency department visits for COVID-like illnesses. Uh, the contact tracing, um, Julie is going to talk a lot more uh, in detail about, but we're looking to have a minimum of 15 contact tracers for every 100,000 people is the, um, 
the number that the governor has set, but Julie's gonna talk about what that means here in Clackamas more. Um, um, do, 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 and the social supports we're gonna go into a little bit more as well. The testing infrastructure, um, I've mentioned to, to several people, I believe that our testing infrastructure in the region has significantly increased recently. Um, there is a number that we should have 30 um, tests per 10,000, I believe, um, per week. And our region is currently at about 22 and a half, but that's what's actually being tested. And I believe that we actually may have that capacity of 30 per, per 10,000 um, people to be tested. We just need to make sure that the right people get tested and that everybody has access to it in an equitable way. Uh, go on to the next slide. So looking more at our county's responsibility, um, Clackamas County's responsibility in opening Oregon, we do have responsibility in enforcing the, the executive orders for physical distancing. So this is a public health law. We have um, you know, some, some enforcement role here. Um, so at this point, we are, our environmental health team is taking reports of violations to physical distancing. Um, when appropriate, referring those to the regulatory agency of, um, of the appropriate matter, and then otherwise uh, giving technical assistance for those facilities that, that may need some more help. Uh, PPE support, so our emergency operations center manages and disseminates PPE. Um, some of this is not in our control though because there is the global supply chain issue with PPE. So we make sure that what we have gets to the right people, um, but what we have is not fully in our control. Uh, health system readiness, this needs to be done with our region. Um, and our region, just to clarify for everybody, is uh, Health Region 1, which includes Clatsop, Columbia, Tillamook, Washington, and Multnomah counties, including Clackamas County. Um, social and behavioral health supports for vulnerable populations, there's a lot of work around that. Um, but the following three, the monitoring data trends, the conducting contact tracing, and the testing are really what is in the wheelhouse of the public health department. Um, so we, we want to ensure linkages to the social and behavioral health um, so that we can enforce the quarantine and isolation recommendations. Um, and I am going to go on to the next slide because we'll have more detail on all of these. So just to reiterate that our physical distancing has really, really worked well to flatten our curve in Oregon. We avoided a surge of COVID illnesses um, that have overwhelmed hospital systems elsewhere in our country and in the world. We, um, we put in place physical distancing early and we've saved lives. Um, we have been fairly flat. Um, Again, this is a picture of the cases, which I talked about. We know that the cases will increase, um, but based on the amount of disease in our region, it really is time to start looking at, um, at reopening and making sure that we can do that safely. So I'm actually gonna pass it over now to uh, Julie Albers, who is our uh, Deputy Public Health Director, um, to talk in more detail about what the Public Health Department is doing. Thank you, Dr. President. Um, I was planning at this point to switch out of the slides and show you the blueprint for Clackamas um, that has more Clackamas specific data, but I'm afraid technology wise that might cause problems. So you can link from the county website to the um, Clackamas blueprint site and there you can filter um, regional data down to the local level. Uh, we're expecting, um, last week we released racial, racial and ethnic ethnicity data. Um, so you can see that there. You can see hospitalization rates, death rates, um, and we're expecting to release zip code data um, in the next few days. So um, that page is a little bit challenging to navigate, but pay attention to the filtering. And if you want to see Clackamas separated out from the region, you can do that there. Um, so this next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit more about what does contact tracing mean? Who does contact tracing? We are hearing all about it in the news every day. Uh, that uh, contact tracing is done by your public health division every day before there was COVID and certainly now that there is COVID-19 in the community. And uh, that was a team of six when we started and they did contact tracing for all reportable diseases that warrant that. For example, tuberculosis, measles, syphilis, uh, HIV, 
uh, and several other uh, diseases. So they're experts at this. They know how to do contact tracing. Uh, they know how to do those interviews and get the information they need to find out where people are. Um, little detectives um, behind the scenes. Um, but of course, the volume of work has grown. Uh, so I'm going to show you where we're at as of today. Uh, in that contact tracing, we are reaching out to every case that's reported to us. Uh, and we are reaching out to every contact of, that, uh, of those cases. So for example, if we have um, a report of a case, uh, his name is Carl. We're gonna call Carl and interview him, um, provided we have reliable contact information to get a hold of Carl. And when we reach Carl, um, we'll find out where he's been, what his symptoms are, when his symptoms began, um, where he works, uh, what his risks of the spread of the disease are. And we're learning that Carl lives with his wife, Stacy. Stacy is symptomatic, uh, as noted there in blue. So she would be considered a presumed case of COVID and qualify for that testing, as she has a link to the symptomatic or this confirmed case. We also learned that their daughter, Alice, who's asymptomatic, lives in their home. Uh, and we're going to do some education with Alice about what that means and what she's able to do. And in the current state, she's not required to quarantine. Um, so Alice um, might be able to go out, but we're gonna recommend that Stacy and Carl isolate in the home. We also learned that Stella lives in this home and so is the sister-in-law and she's also symptomatic. When we inquire about occupation, we learn that Carl works in construction, an essential business, and he rides in the construction vehicle to the site with his two workmates who are also asymptomatic. So in this current state, we will have completed six interviews, um, done six uh, educational conversations, and sent six letters to one to each of these folks um, with instructions on what it means to be a contact, what it means to be symptomatic, what to do if contacts become symptomatic. Uh, and we are keeping up with that work. Uh, we're, we're finding anywhere between zero, we did have a day of zero cases, between zero and 12 cases a day, um, currently hovering between somewhere around five cases a day. Um, and that's managed by a team of about 8.75 FTE investigators. So things are changing and we're preparing for the change. Uh, open organ will obviously cause more contact with other people, which is likely to spread the disease. How many cases a day we will have? I would love your estimates. I'm making this up in terms of trying to guess how many people we may be investigating per day and show you some of those calculations. And as of Friday, we have new investigative guidelines, which are published by Oregon Health Authority to us, which are the guidelines that we use to decide who, uh, what instructions we give to cases and contacts and what information we provide. So the new investigative guidelines have added additional clinical symptoms. You've probably heard about those in the news. Something, things like headache, loss of smell, sore throat, um, chills uh, have been added to the clinical symptoms. And our nurses have a way of um, looking at the combinations of those symptoms and advising as to whether that's likely to be a COVID like symptom um, syndrome of multiple symptoms. Uh, the definition of a close contact will be changing from 60 minutes to 15 minutes. That's so gonna increase the number of contacts that we have for each case. Uh, we will begin investigating those presumed cases uh, as if they are cases and you'll start to see reporting now of um, cases and presumed cases. So now you are the experts and know what a presumed case is. We will begin monitoring um, or return to, I should say, monitoring of asymptomatic contacts for two weeks from exposure. And we were doing this until about the middle of March when we were at several hundred folks needing monitoring and uh, we're allowed to drop that monitoring and so we did. We'll also be asking um, asymptomatic contacts to isolate for 14 days. Uh, so that's a, or, or quarantine for 14 days. That's a whole lot more people um, being asked to quarantine than we're asking now, but currently we're all quarantining to some extent. Um, so in order to support these folks in their isolation and quarantine, we're going to need to be able to offer them social and behavioral health supports. Um, they may be without health insurance because they're off work. They may be without a paycheck. 
um, they may not have a place to quarantine or um, isolate. And so those supports will need to be in place for us to open Oregon. So what does this mean for our case, Carl? So Carl now, um, we know that his wife and his daughter and his sister-in-law all live in his house. The sister-in-law now has a red box around her because she went and got tested and found out that she is positive. So she's a case. She's a red box because I couldn't figure out how to change the color of her. Um, and his two workmates now are going to be asked to quarantine um, because that's the new, the new guidance for them. So they're off of work. And we also learned that Carl ate lunch with his three other workmates every day. And they had not been included in the first place because their contact was too short. And now with a 15 minute contact exposure definition, uh, these three workmates qualify as contacts and will also be quarantining. So if you start to think about this small construction company, we now have five people in one company under quarantine and, and one person under isolation. So this will still be a challenge for businesses to continue to operate when we start quarantining more folks here. Um, we also learned that Carl went to visit his mom and his dad after being um, home for many months. He hasn't seen them, so he's checking on mom and dad. Um, and then we, um, because these presumed cases are getting interviewed, we've learned that uh, his wife Stacy has gone back to work as a childcare provider. So we now have four um, children here that will need to be quarantined uh, and um, interviewed because they've been in contact with, with her. And then the sister-in-law had her friends over uh, and one is asymptomatic, one is symptomatic. She's a confirmed case now because she got tested. So the sister-in-law's friend will be investigated as a presumed case. And we find out she went to the dentist and the dentist and the, high, uh, the dental assistant were wearing full PPE. So they will not be quarantining. Um, they were in appropriate PPE because we didn't open Oregon until we had our PPE in place. We also learned that Carl's mom, after um, all of this physical distancing and isolation, has gone out now to play cards with her card playing group. So we have this group of uh, contacts now um, to uh, investigate. And we find out that um, dad wasn't feeling well and went to urgent care and sat with these two folks in the waiting room. Uh, so we have a lot more folks here on the screen than we did in the current state. Um, that means that the current state is six interviews, six letters, six education visits uh, were done in the current state. We're looking at 27 in this future state and we need to staff accordingly to be able to um, to do these 27 situations. If we have 20 cases in a day, your guess is as good as mine, um, that's 540 interviews, 540 letters, and 420 people under monitoring is what a PUM is, uh, persons under monitoring that we'll be calling and checking in every day uh, and reviewing their symptoms and helping them navigate to testing and care if they are symptomatic. So a huge change in the work, uh, workload. Carl was a pretty simple case. So what if Carl doesn't speak English and lives in a migrant camp? Um, we now have um, all of the folks that he lives with um, that will need to be investigated. Um, and with any luck, that's not happening at a key planting or harvest season for that farmer because now he's gonna have several folks under quarantine uh, in his workforce. Uh, what if Carl lives in a long-term uh, long care facility, a skilled nursing facility? Um, you've heard a lot about those. We take those very seriously and act very aggressively in terms of intervening and assisting those facilities with appropriate uh, procedures in their, in their care and separating sick from well or exposed from well and um, trying to avoid the spread in that fragile population. What if Carl is in a tent with his girlfriend near the forest in Estacada and the time, the time consuming part of that is finding Carl and figuring out who he's been in contact with. Uh, the, the persons experiencing houselessness are a difficult population to reach and to find. They often use uh, street names, making it more difficult to match up with their medical records. Um, what if Carl is an emergency room doctor? Um, that's where it gets easier for us because the hospital systems will investigate their own staff contacts uh, and 
Carl was wearing appropriate PPE, just like the dentist. Uh, when Carl lives in a crowded home with several other people, it becomes really challenging to separate um, and quarantine contacts within a home, particularly when there's children that move about the home pretty freely. Um, so again, one gap that we're needing to address is who will provide the social supports for the isolation and quarantine for these folks. We're asking them to do a lot. Um, Dr. President mentioned that we need 15 investigators per 100,000 people. You probably all did the math in your head. Um, some uh, folks, in, some experts recommend 30 per 100,000. We think the difference there is how much they're counting the social support system. So at a minimum, we're in the 60, 65 range of um, contact investigators. Uh, if you remember, we currently have eight 0.75 FTE doing contact investigations, a couple of managers and our doctor present that consults us. So we have a long ways to go to get to that 65 number. Um, so we have several resources under development. Uh, we have some relationships with nursing schools that have a class of students graduating shortly and we might be able to bring on those entire classes of graduating nurses. Uh, they also have their juniors moving up to the senior class level and seniors, uh, nursing students looking for field work. Uh, so we'll be looking at using those, um, those seniors when they, when they move up in a few weeks. Um, the Oregon Health Authority is um, saying they're going to bring on 600 contact investigators. That's a monumental task to hire and train that many folks. So we're going to need to get a little bit ahead of that and share that burden. Um, of hiring with them. And we have already repurposed county staff and will continue to look at um, the appropriate classifications that can move into this infectious disease investigation work. So we've already moved our community health nurses, uh, nurse over and we're moving some of our environmental health staff um, over. They're good regulators and good investigators uh, and the restaurants are not all open. So they've got some time to help us out. Um, so yeah, that's it on contact investigations. Next up, we talked a little bit about testing and uh, the hospital systems and health region are preparing to uh, work together to do testing. So it doesn't matter what facility that you go to, where your insurance is, some cross-shared, um, cross-jurisdictional, if you will, testing within those facilities. That works really nicely for Carl and his wife and his sister-in-law. Um, but some folks have a harder time to get into those testing options and those testing sites. So we're looking to build some go teams that might be able to go out to sites where we have outbreaks, uh, folks that don't have insurance, folks that might be undocumented and afraid to come into care, um, those, those fragile long-term care facility situations where we really want to get out and get on top of it quickly. Some of them have their own nursing staff and some of them do not. Uh, those houseless community members that are a little more challenging to access into care, and then um, any symptomatic contact of a case that can't get into a private uh, testing option, we'll be looking to have GO teams to go out and get on that testing quickly to reduce the spread. And I'm going to send it back to Dr. Present. No, never mind. Sorry, this is mine. So phase one, what to expect. So um, the governor's plan has three phases. I am basing this slide off the draft plan. I understand that a more firm plan of the phasing is coming out perhaps today. Um, so what I know about phase one is that it might vary by the region of the state. Those areas of the state with low case counts might uh, open first. Um, the governor's office has sector specific work groups that are determining what's reasonable and reopening. So there's restaurant groups, transit groups, um, county apparently, and city government groups, retail, childcare. Um, so a variety of work groups that are uh, figuring out operating procedures that would support physical distancing. Um, this only, phase one will only happen when the safeguards are in place. And what we're hearing about phase one is small social gatherings like Carl's mother's card players, um, non-emergency medical procedures, those opened up on May 1st, although some have been delayed in opening up for lack of PPE. 
from some personal services, from your accountant to your hair salon. So we're all uh, looking forward to some of those services. And then sit down dining with physical distancing and um, I'm hearing anywhere from a third to a half of the normal seating uh, would be allowed. And then of course that's a, a small profit margin for those, those restaurants and it may not be a, achievable to, to be open at, at half capacity. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Present. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna wrap it up here with, um, you know, we, we've talked about recovery and resiliency and this uh, presentation is really about reopening, but we always wanna be thinking about recovery and resiliency um, throughout the whole process. So a lot of the challenges that have um, already impacted our community and um, things that we need to be looking for opportunities to do things better as we come out of this in, into our new normal. Um, so looking at behavioral health, we know that depression, anxiety, suicide, and substance use um, have had increases during this time. How do we address those services in a way that um, is perhaps better when we, as we start reopening, but making, making sure that these are top in our mind as that reopening ha work happens. Economic health, um, we are, we're well aware of the impact, um, but other things like family dynamics, um, in-house abuse, divorce, conflict from people being um, quarantined in the home um, has had a lot of, of rippling effects that we believe. And I think as we reopen, we will have a better idea of what these effects really have been. Um, education, parents are the new teachers. Um, the variety in education for children's right now, for children right now is huge. Um, some people have access to good education and are continuing work. Many do not. Um, a lot depends on the level of stress in the household and how much parents are able to do. Access to, med access to services, um, you know, the, the access to medical services for COVID-like uh, illness is one thing, but what about all the chronic illnesses, um, the people who have had televisits, as we open up and start seeing patients more and doing, you know, going back to routine lab work, um, we'll have to see how this has, has affected people's health um, and you know, what can we do better in the future? Because there might be a lot of opportunity in this telehealth that's really good for people. Um, you know, in, in each of these things, I think that there are gonna be teachings and lessons that we can build on that are good. Um, and the environmental impacts, I've, I've talked with a number of people about that. We know that our carbon emissions have gone down, our oil use has gone down, uh, while people are um, using less transportation. Uh, but there's a lot more use of, um, you know, non-reusable packaging. And as, as we reopen, you know, what are people going to go back to? Um, there are all sorts of opportunities to think about. But most of this we will um, leave for the uh, recovery and resiliency conversations. And I think that ends our presentation. So we will happily take some questions. We have Commissioner Humberston and then Commissioner Savas. You're on mute, Commissioner. Oops. <laughs> Just wondering if this document was ready for publication to the general public. It could be published with the general public. What I would recommend, um, and I can send a link to Drenda to, to send to you all, is the new guidance that was published minutes before this presentation was uh, sent to you. So um, there's a prerequisite for phase reopening of Oregon that has the details. Dr. President uh, spoke to those details, um, but we'll make sure you have those. And I think they were probably sent to you, but we can send them again. Uh, and there's a spot on the Oregon Health Authority website that has lots of these uh, documents for details. But yes, you may share this presentation. So send me that new link and, and I'll, I'll use that one that's, since that's the newest. At your convenience, thank you. No worries, it does not have all the contact tracing details in it, so you can have both. Paul? Yeah, well, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I don't wanna get ahead of the day's plans with regard to the um, prerequisites, unless this is the time. So maybe I'll just ask for that clarification. Is this the time to talk about that a little bit? Um, but what's pertinent to that, that we did kind of cover was, I'm not sure who spoke to it, but um, the admissions data will be 
the admissions data will be part of the measurement as far as how we're how we're progressing and I'm struggling to find that anywhere. I did look at the OHA website. I looked at the dashboard. I can see a graph for the hospitalized. I can see a graph for the hospital visits, but I can't, I don't see a data point that indicates what the daily admissions are per se. Um, and when I looked at the hospitalized, for example, and I saw the graph, I'm, I'm a, and my question is, is that like a, is that, somewhat representative of a new admission or is that just the current status of those that are hospitalized with COVID? So um, I'll just, not to overwhelm anyone with questions, I'll just kind of put that out there. Does any, is there a point I can find the admissions? So the, the graph that we have that has hospitalized versus cases is um, based on the date of hospitalization. So not currently hospitalized, but when they went in. And I believe that that is by week. So that gives us some idea um, but you're right, we don't have the actual daily admission data up, and that is something that OHA will be putting on their website. I don't know the time frame on that, um, but they will have that, and we can work with our data folks on our regional website um, to be more clear about that. Now, that. now that that is defined as a prime criteria, then we will need to make sure that it is available. If, if, if there's any, other, any opportunity uh, in speaking to the OHA, I, I, I might... I'm sure maybe there's multiple places that could be placed on the OHA website. I really, I go to that several times a day, so that's a great resource for me. But it would be nice to at least have that data maybe alongside another column alongside the county reports of the county demographics where it lists the admissions and the deaths and so on. But if there could be another graph and have that placed there, that will be, I think, a good one-stop point on the website to monitor how we're doing with that. The other thing I wanted to jump, I just want to get an answer to, I'm not sure who can, um, with, with uh, the prerequisites and the region, the health region we're defined as with all those counties. Um, is this the time to talk about that? Or is that later today? That, that is part of this discussion. So if, if I guess first, if there's any questions about the slide deck you just saw, but I would like Nancy and team to talk about the governor's prerequisites and, and where we're at as a county. So. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. So I've done some review of the drafts. They were from last week of the different industries and I, I just can't wrap my mind around how we, some of these industries are going to be able to social distance and function such as the um, just restaurants. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I know that the masks are strongly encouraged in some businesses, but not required. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. And if Clackamas County can have different guidelines than the state as far as if we wanted to require say like face masks for everyone um so i think i don't know about uh, our sort of regulatory ability on that honestly but i i i don't think that requirements at the county level um, get to that sort of detail um, about wearing face masks face masks. Um, I think that that is more of a, a, a statewide call, but we'll have to, I'll have to ask others, um, legal expert, experts on, on the specifics on that. I do think that we need to all think about social distancing as being more effective than face masks. Um, we know that a surgical mask or an N95 can help with respiratory droplets, but there are a lot of problems with face masks and people, again, I, there are a lot of false sense of security of, oh, I have something on my face that means I'm safe, whereas oftentimes people touch their face more often and um, um, there's potentially even more spread than they are realizing. Similarly with gloves, um, uh, we've worked with food service for a long time. A lot of people think as long as they're wearing gloves, they're fine, but if you're still touching dirty things and touching your face and not changing your gloves, um, it's not safer than just frequently washing your hands. So I, I think that the things that are most effective are these environmental and engineering controls. And then PPE is, is sort of the last addition. Um, 
But it's a, it's a great question. I think that each individual sector is going to have a challenge. And I know one thing that we've heard is that for those who are sort of allowed to reopen, if they're not able to social distance, they may not qualify for the same unemployment um, sorts of things if they're not being told that they have to close. So those are some, some things that we need to still factor in. Um, you know, reopening doesn't mean that our economy is going <laughs> to bump back. Um, I wanted to go back to Commissioner Savas's question also quickly about the uh, regions. So there are a couple of different preparedness regions as far as counties. Um, the, the region that we are in is a hospital preparedness organization region that has been established for, for many, many years. Um, and some of that has to do with the funding source. Um, there was FEMA funding, there was CDC funding, um, and a number of different things, but the, the hospital region that is defined has actually been working as a region for quite some time as far as planning on uh, preparedness and response issues just like this. Um, and it is, we have a, a an HPO sort of liaison who is Catherine Richer, um, who has, you know, good connections and has been working with this group for quite some time. And I don't know if that helps answer that, that concern or question you had. Yeah, if uh, yeah, if I could follow. Um, thank you for that clarification. So, um, what I'm gathering um, nationally uh, in, with regard to this crisis is that um, where you know the social distancing and all the all the precautions we're taking currently, we have flattened the curve, and the buzz right now is that where we are today is some people are saying is not necessarily as good as it gets, but that's probably going to be, you know, we're going to remain at this level of admissions and, and new cases and so forth. And, and we're in a better place than a lot of states, granted. Um, and if that's the case, then um, looking at the prerequisites and looking for a ramp down from there to here, that might be just practically unachievable, period, right? if now we've already done that. So if the measurement's taking, I mean, let's just say that we've got to look at from today forward to the next two weeks, and we know that everything we're doing is as good as it gets. Um, are we setting ourselves up for a situation we really can't, can't improve much upon other than taking more drastic constraints and restrictions upon activity? Um, that's one issue. And then the other one, if you could address that, which is related, is that my concern on the regional aspect is if one county is doing well in one regard and another county is not doing so well and you're part of that region, it looks to me like the metric isn't about how each county is doing, but how that health region is doing collectively. And that's concerning. So if our health regions, what's, rec what's required of them is the healthcare capacity, sufficient PPE and uh, testing. So if our region as a health hospital system has that, and then what's required of the counties is like the staffing to do contact tracing, it's possible that Clackamas could open prior to one of those other counties in our region if they don't, as long as the health, we are reliant on the healthcare system being ready, yes. And I am concerned that that is one of our big, um, roadblocks in that PPE is still not reliable. I mean, that's a, that's a huge issue and I, it's not something that we have control over. However, if the hospital systems get there and one county has their contact tracing in place and the other doesn't, then the county that does have their contact tracing in place, I believe can open um, prior to that other county. Okay, uh, but on the, on the specifically number one of, of the prerequisites, the declining prevalence, is that that's not a regional Requirement? No. no. County. For the, um, well, it's, it is regional because it's based on hospital admissions and our hospital systems are um, our regional systems. That's how I read it. That's my concern. Yeah. Martha, did you have your hand up? No. I don't see any hands raised. So not seeing any more questions, I would ask if Nancy, Sarah, and Julie, if you could quickly review the governor's prerequisite checklist and where you feel you will wear out as a county 
because that is what our commissioners are hearing from the public. When are we reopening? So that is the guide. We are not allowed to until we meet these standards recommended by the governor. So please go ahead. You're on mute, Nancy. I got used to not talking. Um, I, I'll start a little bit with that and then I will have uh, Dr. President and Julie jump in where they need to. Um, so some of the things that we're looking at here, you know, you, we've already talked about the fewer cases that the hospital emissions. Um, and we've talked a lot about the contact tracing and what we're looking at there. And we're looking at some pretty big numbers there. Julie was saying, you know, 65, you know, to like 135, depending on what they're talking about. Um, and we do have some ideas of how we can get that done, but it, we don't have it in place yet. And we still have a lot of planning to do around that. Um, the readiness to uh, talking about, you know, where are we going to be able to put um, people that are COVID positive that may not have a place to go. Uh, we do have a facility right now that we have, uh, I think, 24 rooms, which is not that many. Um, if we have an increase in COVID, then we do have um, an outbreak in, in that population that we need um, more um, you know, either a hotel or someplace that we know that we can put those individuals in where it's safe and that we have the capacity to do that. I will say some of the things we do have in place for that, I, we do have funding that has been identified for that, which is funding for my disaster management, um, some of the uh, funding that we had there for contingency, and we are working with the hotels trying to get at least one or two hotels to get that set up. Um, it, it's it, not inexpensive, um, but we, we're working toward that, but it is not in place yet. Um, the PPE, um, you know, as Dr. President mentioned, that's something that we can't control either, but we do need to make sure that um, the hospitals as well as our EMS community, which is fire, um, that they have their own way of getting their PPE. They cannot be relying on the county to provide that. Um, and making sure that those, um, the streams and that supply chain is now open. And we are still getting, um, some of the fire agencies are having problems still getting PPE. And I know, and I'll let Dr. President talk a little bit more, but I think the hospitals is also having that, that uh, problem as well. Uh, we have, we don't have enough gowns. Um, there's, we've also had some booties that we don't have enough booties. We don't have enough Tyvek suits. So that is not resolved as well. So we're still working on that, but again, that that's a system that we don't completely control. Um, Dr. President or Julie, do you wanna add more to this and where we are currently and what we need to do as we move forward? One thing that I would add, um, it looks, if you're following along in the prerequisite checklist, um, finalize statewide sector guidelines. Um, and those are those work groups that are working with each sector of the community. So what will the guidelines be for transit? What will they be for restaurants? Um, that's out of our control, but it, it is underway. Um, that was just one that had been skipped over. Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. So I'm a bit confused about the testing capacity. What's being required and where we are and what we have available? The 30 tests per 10,000 population is the requirement. Uh, and we're at 22.5 for the region, I believe. Is that correct, Dr. President? Um, yes, yes, that's correct. And what will be the process to increase that capacity? And along with that, I'm concerned about different areas being in competition with one another as well, if that's an issue or a concern. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that I think that is a concern as far as the you know testing capacity is based on um, sites available to test, and I think we've got that. Um, but it's also dependent on PPE to safely test and on testing supplies, which are, um, I, I know that um, the, the governor's plan that she, uh, or the, the press conference she had on Friday talked about the health systems working together 
Um, I honestly don't know all the details about that and how that's going to um, affect the flow of materials, but I'm assuming that that is an attempt to make sure that, that hospital systems are not um, competing with each other uh, for the materials and that we just increase accessibility for testing over the state. Um, I, I can't speak any more to that at this point. I don't see any other hands. Oh, somebody, let's see. Paul, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, so I don't know where we are in the rollout of the, of the remaining time left, but if I go back to the prerequisites and there's <laughs> seven of them, um, there's a couple ways of going about this, um, asking the question. I can see that like under number seven, for example, um, it's clearly underlined. It says this metric is measured at the health region level, not at the county level. So hypothetically, my question is if there is a county that's in our region one, health region one, um, that decides they're going to try to um, open the county premature, their county prematurely and businesses go back to work and, you know, the infection rate goes up, that's going to bring the whole region down. Is that correct? Okay, then uh, if, it, if that's correct, and that my concern is that, um, um, and I apologize to Dr. Sarah and, and, um, and Nancy, perhaps everyone else was not part of our earlier discussion, but I kind of touched on this when uh, Commissioner Bernard mentioned that the chairs of the Health Region 1 um, were going to have a meeting and uh, there was a concern about not, I, I, my suggestion was to have a, um, a, a that health region one meeting include all the county commissioners. And I know that's a public meetings uh, difficulty to some degree, but you know, we do have the AOC legislative exception and maybe the AOC could actually convene that kind of a meeting. That's my question. It's kind of also a legal one if Mr. Madcore is on the line as well. But because of, because if one county goes awry or astray, and it brings us all down. It seems that we need to be coordinated and we all need to be working together. And my suggestion is that there be um, a, uh, a meeting of, of the key people involved in that, including the commissioners and the chairs, obviously, um, and have that greater discussion because we need to convey that to our constituencies in all those counties. And um, that's, that's, a, that's a serious issue because of the economic impacts the, the unfortunate negative economic impacts this crisis already placed upon us and furthering that every day is really amounts to millions of dollars of loss to everyone. So it would behoove us all not to work together cooperatively to help bring those numbers down and help us qualify to get us to that, those prerequisites needed for reopening. Was the question to me, commissioner, that whether this is to be a public meeting? And my answer would be yes. If you're okay. three or more of you, three or more of you from any jurisdiction, well, depending upon the size of their jurisdictions as well, their boards. Right. So I, I wasn't sure when Commissioner Bernard mentioned that, you know, that some of that, some of the topics that the chairs would share was confidential. I didn't know if the AOC statute um, that allows um, those meetings to be held in, in a, um, uh, in a different with different requirements. For example, quorums, there, there can be a meeting um, when quorums are present. I didn't know if that allowed for the typical AOC meetings, which are really not public, right? Um, um, the conf teleconferences we're having, or the, yeah, the teleconferences we're having on Friday mornings, for example, at 11 o'clock, uh, those aren't necessarily public, right? You have exceptions to public meeting law, but if you are, going to be having a quorum of Clackamas and a quorum of Columbia and they're deliberating about reopening or they're deliberating about matters of county concern, then those would be public meetings. They would have to be noticed, they'd have to be accessible just like this current Zoom one is. There are exceptions for conferences and other kind of body politic sections, gatherings under the public meeting law, but meeting to deliberate about COVID-19 with our fellow jurisdictions would not be, uh, would not fall under those exceptions. 
Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, my, I, I, I just didn't understand. Um, I'm all for the public meeting and all for the region talking about this. Um, I just didn't know. I was a little bit caught off guard. I don't understand what part of the prerequisites in this discussion we're having currently publicly um, is confidential. It seems to me that, that the conversation I'm asking for with regard to this topic and prerequisites, how we reopen our reopen Oregon, and now with this layout here of these prerequisites, I think it's it's absolutely necessary that we all be discussing this together. Every well, election. I official. never said I never said it was confidential, Paul. I said it's helpful to us for us to have an opportunity to talk freely. Okay, well, then all, all I'm saying is that I brought that up under the context I just described, that these prerequisites and working together and having a public, no, I'm not saying it's a public, it's, that it's not a public discussion, but at least the ability, which requires a public discussion, that this is, this is necessary. Every commissioner, and frankly, even, even the city councils to some degree um, ought to be involved. That complicates it, that just gets a bigger thing. But these are, this spells out, not cities, but it spells out the counties. And if these are the prerequisites, the counties need to be talking with one another. So I would like to add that we are planning a, a, a meeting, but Multnomah County's in the middle of budget. She can't do it until late in the month. And we were trying to get it done earlier because we would like to open this. So we're just gonna call the chairs and find out where they are on this issue. That's all we're doing. On, on which issue, Jim? On where they are in the hospitals and their equipment, those issues. And we already have somebody coordinating that. I think Nancy mentioned that with uh, various hospitals in the region. We're, we don't want the, exactly what you're talking about. We don't want one county to pull down the other. But I can assure you, it's probably not Tillamook or Clatsop or Columbia that will pull down the region. It's a larger counties like Multnomah, okay. Washington, Clatsop. Okay, and I, I appreciate I appreciate that, Jim. I, I really do. I'm not I'm not rebutting. I'm not arguing. Um, but as you mentioned, it's about you said about the hospitals. So there's elements of the prerequisites that are not necessarily hospital. So, for example. PPE supply. Um, granted, they're you know they need the PPE. Yes, um, healthcare capacity is part of that. Um, um, statewide sector guidelines. Um, there's things in here in these prerequisites that are not necessarily hospital related that I think are worth talking about. Um, but well, I yeah, this is complex. I, I, this was kind of discouraging to read the prerequisites and realize that's that's a heavy lift. Um, that's going to be a very complicated heavy lift, let alone uh, just standing up all of the, the tracing elements of it itself is a huge task for everyone to do. And I, you know, I think that's going to take out some substantial skill sets for every, every person that's a tracer um, calling on the phone and talking to an individual that might be possibly going through a, a crisis of their own, a, a personal crisis or a mental health crisis, just because of maybe they are um, been contacted uh, or exposed. Um, that's that's going to reveal. That's going to put a lot. That's a huge workload, and um, there's the economics of that. I think there's a human element of that. This is a this is a big deal, and this this looks to me like a, a lot of work and time before it can even be implemented. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to find out, so we can tell the governor on Friday. We think this is a huge lift, and we don't know, frankly whether as a medical region, we can, uh, health region, we can do this. That's gonna be, that's what I wanna find out from their chairs. And that's why we're calling for Friday. <laughs> so Gary Schmidt, Ken Humberston, and then Commissioner Fisher. I just wanna answer this question that Chair Bernard just did. Uh, so this Friday is a call with the governor and the six counties within our health region. And so that's what Chair Bernard was saying, a, a phone call with the six county chairs just to get some general prep for that Friday meeting. But I'm hearing Commissioner Savas suggest 
a meeting of all county commissioners in those six counties, which you certainly can put together. I'm not sure if we can do it before this Friday, but after this Friday, certainly as a health region, we can do that as in preparation of the finalization of all these plans. So I just wanted to acknowledge Commissioner Savas's request. We can certainly arrange that of all six counties and all commissioners gather, but I don't think we can do it by this Friday, but we could do it next week or the week after. Mr. Humberston. Thank you. I don't, <clears throat> frankly, don't see the necessity of, of having um, upwards of 30 commissioners along with the support staff that go along with that in trying in, in moving this forward. We have a leadership team of, of the chairs of the six counties uh, who get their information from the EOC chair, the EOC directors and the doctor. And I think if we have an idea, we can funnel it upwards to Jim and he could take it forward to that, to that leadership group. But this is not C4 where you can take a year and a half to do bylaws. This is an emergency situation where six counties are gonna have to work together. And it's gonna take a leadership team that can be fairly focused and, and frankly uh, limited so that we can get done what needs to be done and move quickly. Um, I just think that adding 30, 40 more voices into this just complicates it and makes it very difficult to get something done. Um, this is not a time to be governing uh, by huge committee. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, so I was gonna say what Ken said as well. Um, I do think that we do need to spend this time today getting information to Jim and have a reach a consensus on what is most important to Clackamas County is well armed to talk to the chairs and so that we can have a cohesive and consistent and productive conversation with the governor on Friday. Some and it might be good for each of us to just go around and say what are our biggest concerns about the framework for our community and just share that so that Jim understands. I think, I'll just tell you what I think in this. I think it is a heavy lift, Jim. I am concerned, and it may be that I just don't know, but when it comes to we have to have so many tests available for so much of the population, so much of that is out of our control. And I'm just concerned about how are we going to meet these requirements? Some of them make a whole, oh, Dr. President, did you wanna say something? I, I, I do, <laughs> thank you. Um, in thinking about the tests, I, 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 f I actually feel pretty confident about our health systems having adequate testing. What I am not as confident in is our ability to get those testing to those populations that need it, where that is under our control as far as building our, our GO teams, making sure that we have the right people who can go out and test in the long-term care facilities. Um, you know, we have, we have been talking about that and have um, some ideas, but I think I always, like, I always like to go back to what is in our control that is going to be ready as soon as the other things outside of our control are, are you know, once they open up, I want to be able to be staffed and have those plans for getting the tests to the right people. I, I just want to, I just want to reiterate that that's my, my larger concern. So, yeah, so, I really, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate you clarifying that because when I look at, you know, 22 tests per, or 30 tests per 10,000, and we have so many people in this region because of Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas counties, it just seems overwhelming to me. So I appreciate you clarifying that. So Jim, a couple other concerns that I have, and I know you have talked to mayors outside of the urban areas and they are really itching to open and they don't understand why they can't open. So I'm concerned that Clackamas County is unique in the region in how, and we are urban rural. So I don't know how that plays in to what we're doing, but I can see that we might need some look at things differently as well as the other three counties that are much smaller than us. What does all of this mean to them? I um, think that's a really important question and I think we need to support each other and really listen to the smaller counties so that we can um, speak in one hospital region voice on this. 
So those are my, what are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> are, you, are you in the water, Jim? Must be this tree. Oh, yeah. So I don't know uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, well, I agree. I mean, the challenge is, is that when you've got a place like Estacada or, uh, or Sandy, where 60, 70% of people leave town to go to work, they all go back. The question like the mayor of Sandy said is, well, where are they going to work? Because none of the businesses are open, but that there's a danger there. It, you know, I agree, uh, Tillamook and, and Clatsop and uh, Columbia County are very different, but they're part of a region. So if there's a big push for need for health, hospital stays, they come to us. And so we have to make sure we're okay. If I were them, I would be the uh, worried that they're attached to us rather than the other way around. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're gonna try to talk to the governor about. Mr. Savas? Yeah, um, well, I would, I'm gonna, I thought maybe uh, Commissioner Humberson's uh, bringing up the C4 thing might be something I'm going to build on a little bit. Um, so, and and not that anyone who's listening probably knows what that is, but yeah, you know, when, yeah, I guess suppose if one, it's a great example on that if if one mayor wants to, you know, push an issue on bylaws and drag something down, um, then you know, and the analogy here, transferring that over is that currently we kind of have some mayors that are anxious to open up ahead of everyone else. And therefore that fragmentation, if you will, at the mayor city level leads me to my question about the zip code analysis of how we're doing by zip code in Clackamas County and the other counties as well, but particularly Clackamas County. Do we have a zip code map as far as those cases? Because we need to quell our cities and our communities within our county um, just as all the other counties need to do that as well but being that we have a little bit of discussions going around um, and some more anxious to open than others um, um, I, I, I think um, um, that's we need to have some kind of measurement of that so do we have a zip code analysis completed yet in Clackamas County do have um, a zip code map that we that we have viewed it's not been published we're expecting OHA to publish zip code data today uh, I haven't heard the, the rest of that and then the, the region will follow suit with publishing um, on our dashboard the, the zip code data is, is it accurate I, I just heard I mean it's not it was informal but I heard perhaps that um, really almost every zip code has a COVID case is that fair I yeah. think that's something that I mentioned, and yes, it's it's not. I can give you the teaser that there's not a clear urban-rural divide in our number of cases at this time. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. So, I, if I could, I just want to just go back to this 14-day again. Uh, item number one on the prerequisites: this 14-day decline in COVID-19. So here we are. We're doing great. Um, it may be just that we're going to be stagnant here at this lowest, this low level. How do we? How do we? How do we get to a decline? from here. I think that's why it's a decline and not, it, it changed from cases to hospital admissions. Because well, yes, it, it says right here, um, uh, item B under number one uh, dec of declining prevalence of COVID-19, it states a 14 day decline in COVID-19 hospital admissions. Right, and what we're expecting is testing increases that will be testing lower risk folks. And um, so case counts will go up, but hospital admissions, because we're on top of that contact tracing, um, may go down. I don't know if Dr. President has more to add to that. Yeah, so um, uh, we are gonna be sharing with you the, the SIT stat for the HPO region, I think. Um, that's not public, but we will share that with you that has more details that I think will be helpful um, as we, to, to inform this conversation. Um, the, the idea of controlling the spread um, and protecting our vulnerable populations um, is that as the disease spreads, we're still protecting those who are most vulnerable. 
from getting it. Um, and that's where the intensive contact tracing comes in um, to try to make sure that we you know, protect the spread as much as possible, especially in those high-risk areas. If we can keep the disease away from the high-risk vulnerable populations, um, assuming we assume that we can keep the hospitalizations under control. And so even if we have more cases throughout the, the lower risk population, there is, they're not as likely to have the hospitalizations. I, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Um, and so that's where the sort of really our focused disease investigation and contact tracing. Yeah, when, when I and combine- it, prevent Hospitalizations, even with increasing caseloads. Okay, yeah, when I combine A, B, and C together of that, I, it's not really clear because we have 200 something cases, so we're above the five case threshold, right? Under item C, but um, if our let's say our admissions are at at uh, at uh, let's say one one admission per day, um, how do we um, and that's going to be let's just say it's flat at one a day. How do we really improve upon that? Yeah, so I think um, you know this is the the prerequisite for reopening, and I think that we are close to that fourteen day decline in, in admissions, if not already there. And we need to be ready for a 20% surge. So, so that decline needs to happen to start the reopening. Once the reopening starts, we know that we might have more and we don't have to keep that decline happening. We just need to prevent, um, we need to be prepared for the surge. And then if the surge is overwhelming the systems, the hospital systems, we need to be able to monitor that and then pull back or close down more things if we need to, if they're not managing the surge that we do expect. So the, 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 the decline can be measured from the peak of, of, our, of our case in, Cl in Clackamas County, which occurred maybe two or three weeks ago? Or is there, is there an established starting point for the 14 days? It's really, if we, if we choose the date that Clackamas is reopening um, to phase one, the, the phase one reopening, then we have to have had a 14 day average decline in admissions prior to that reopening date. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm, I, it doesn't sound like, it doesn't look like I'm answering your question. 14 days prior to, I think, is what Commissioner Stavis is getting at. I don't know if we know the answer. Uh, yeah, which may not mathematically be achievable, is right. my, most of my point. Right. So, I believe there will be something built in to, to address that, but I don't know those details. And if, if that's something you want Commissioner Bernard to take to the governor, that, that might be appropriate. Yes, Just a quick point that all of the all of the uh, zip code analysis does tells you that there's a person or some people in a specific get zip code that that have shown positive for the for the virus. It doesn't tell you where they're going, where they've been, how they got it, uh, or anything else. And when you consider the amount of movement currently going on under a semi-lockdown and then you go to what it will be when people start going back to work and driving again that's 70 percent of folks that, that leave clackamas county and go to work outside of clackamas county just to name our three county region um you know it, it's it's going to be a, a very difficult situation and um until we have the PPE in place and the other monitoring things that are, are being recommended, I think we have to be very, very cautious how we go forward. I appreciate that point, Commissioner Humbertson, because uh, if you remember back to case one in Oregon, um, the work fell in Clackamas County because that's where the, the, the first case was employed. So it, yep. it, it is a regional approach for, for that reason. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I, ha I have another. I have another one um, related to the PPE, um, and and I, that is that um, the there's two elements of the PPE. One for the public sector, which I presume that um, one of the prerequisites applies to, right? Um, under number seven for the hospital system and the health system. And um, so my question with that regard, on, on, in that that aspect of it, is, is that is how aggressive is the state? um seeking the ppe and the testing and are we really nationally competing with each other um and where do we foresee um is there a date that we 
I don't see a specific date, obviously, but is there a rough period of time we think that we might be able to accomplish um, this measure uh, of the of the supply of both testing and PPE? Do we see like is that a month away or or three months away or is that tomorrow? Nancy, can you speak to that one? I, I can at least speak to the PPE piece. So. I can't answer the question right now. We're looking into that. And we, um, like I said this morning, even we are working with our fire districts right now to say, you know, cause they continue to send orders into us and say, well, are your supply chains opening up? Have you went to your normal supplier to find this? And if they couldn't give it to you, did you try to find another supplier? So we're actively working on that question. Um, and where do we think we are in the process? And when you ask if we are competing nationally, absolutely. I mean, we all have the same supply chains and um, we are. So if we can't get PPE, it may be because it's going to the East Coast where they have some larger outbreaks or whatever. So yeah, I cannot answer the question if it's gonna be next week or if it's gonna be a month, but we're looking into that to try to figure that out and hopefully have some answers um, to Administrator Schmidt by Friday on what we, we think that time frame is going to look like. And Dr. President, I'll leave the testing question to you or Julie. Well, let on me we think on PPE too. Um, something I heard this morning is some states on the east, northeast uh, forming a buying consortium. So uh, that may be also a reasonable conversation with the governor about whether we want to partner with the states we're in a pact with. Uh, economics is not my expertise, but something to think about. Um, Dr. President, do you want to answer the question about testing and when, when we think we might be able to be have more robust? I mean, I'm assuming that will come with when we have more um, contact tracing and we have more staff to be able to do some of the testing. Right, so there are there are the two components. We need to get our staff hired and in place, um, and that's the contact tracing and um, sort of our testing go teams. That's all kind of part of the public health division plan. Um, and it's also uh, the same question as the as the PPE and buying consortiums for the materials for testing. Um, I think that, yeah, I think those are the, the two main things. So what we, what we have control over is our, uh, is our staffing and getting that in place so that we have the people to, to do the testing. And um, yeah, that's it. So a, a follow. Do we foresee all the testing be handled by the health center or the health authorities, or or can private businesses do testing? So many. So most of the testing will be through the um, the healthcare system, which includes our hospital systems as well as private um, private systems. You know, we've got a number of urgent cares that are already providing testing, um, even some pretty large, easy, low barrier testing. Um, I know that RFQHC provides testing for their patients who need it. Again, it's, it's, um, I think that there are people who are able to do the test for the symptomatic people who need it. Um, and there's a lot of motivation amongst the healthcare system to provide that. Um, what we need to be in control of is for those people who are unable to get to the healthcare f system through transportation issues or, you know, whether, you know, for, for whatever reasons. And that's where the health department will um, we'll have a role. If, if I was a well capitalized business per se, um, and I had, let's say a few thousand employees and I really would aggressively wanted to get back to business. Um, I would be out there also competing for PPE and I, maybe even possibly even testing to certify that or to convey to my customers or my employees that, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're going to do the testing. We're going to do the, the PPE. We're going to make sure everyone's safe. Um, take all those measures and it just seems to me that that is a, um, a highly competitive sets up a very highly competitive environment where the private sector is trying to do what it needs to do the public sector is trying to get its PPE and I think it would behoove maybe the the, the state our governor uh, the, the those in power to look at you know how, how much of that can we do 
in, in the state of Oregon as far as manufacturing. We, we, got a, we really are serious about stepping it up. I think states should take on some, some form of, and I know they are, for example, um, uh, some, some are, some have that capacity, but we ought to be looking at how we, how we uh, assist um, the private sector, we government, not necessarily Oregon alone, but all, all governments and how we assist the supply chain, because that, that's going to be, that, that, that's going to be dictate how soon we open. Hey, Chair Bernard, I don't see any other hands raised. All right. Uh, any other questions? Wait a second. Oh, my mic's not. It's on. All right. Uh, any other questions? Well, then we'll meet oh, back. Commissioner Fisher. Okay. Yeah, so I just want to piggyback Jim and suggest that we share what Paul just said with the governor. I do know that some, like Nike's manufacturing PPE, and there are other private industries that have really stepped up huge. I've heard that from the governor's conversations with us. But Paul, I think you're absolutely right. And to get that facilitated at a statewide level is ever so critical to get open and stay open and to really keep control of this. So um, Jim, put that down on your list. Okay. No. Talk to the other, um, the other chairs about, please. Okay. All right. We're back at 1.30, correct, Gary? Yes, so we're going to end right now. We got through one out of 12 issues, so we will continue issues at 2 p.m. or as soon as the 1.30 session ends. So I apologize to the staff who have been waiting. We'll pick up right where we left off. Uh, if I may just wrap this up. So the next immediate step is you commissioners will be speaking with the governor this Friday to hear her uh, her comments on this checklist and you can offer your feedback and then staff will continue to modify this form and keep you updated on the status of where staff feels we're at in achieving these prerequisites on this list. So we will continue this conversation with you and we'll continue our issues list at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.